Hello, and welcome to my live stream. This is Thursday, which means I'm here because this has been happening for like three plus years now, every Thursday. So thanks for showing up. If you're not watching this live, come back on Thursdays. The reason that I do this live and I have guests is so that you can ask questions and you can control the topics and all the stuff we want to talk about. But first, thanks to you members. So the Patreon, patron members, the Discord boosters, now we have YouTube uh, memberships, all these things all gives you essentially the same benefits. You get to support me, my open source work, all the stuff I do, the podcast, the live show, the GitHub stuff, the Discord community server, which we just hit 12,000 people. I'm excited about that. Join over there, devops.fan. Uh, we just talk all things DevOps, mostly containers, but uh, more than that. And you can come and hang out. And then for exclusive benefits, if you want to jump over to Patreon, of course, that's right here. I show it every week. You don't have to give me money. You can scroll down and join one of the packages, which they've changed now the interface today. Yay, we've changed stuff. You can click the follow button and you don't have to pay me anything. You can just follow, get all the updates every week. What's in the podcast? Who's in the live show? What new silly examples am I putting on GitHub about container crap? Okay. Let's get to it. Uh, by the way, you know about the Discord server, right? You heard about that last week. You also know about the merch store. It's there, including my Kubernetes shirts that I'm going to wear at KubeCon. If you're going to be at KubeCon, reach out to me on Twitter or in Discord or however you want. Find me. Let me know you're going to be there. And let's hang out. Let's grab lunch or a beer or whatever. And we'll do that. All right. This week, I'm excited because security, one of my favorite topics. And I have some security pros uh, on the call. I say the call. It's a stream. I'm old fashioned. You can see the gray. Um, all right. So in the middle there, we have Dan Lawrence, the CEO of ChainGuard. Uh, we're going to talk all about this stuff, what that even is. Uh, we got Kim Landowski over on the right there. Yeah, it's on the right. She's the head of product at ChainGuard. And let's get into it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for, Thanks having, for us. having us. Yeah. All right, Kim. Uh, we were talking before the show. How did how did ChainGuard get started? What's the backstory here? Because it suddenly existed one day. Everyone was telling me about it, and I, I, I didn't know what it was. Yeah, great question. Uh, I think I think the very origins of the story are CEO uh, Matt Moore <clears throat> was barbecuing, <laughs> spending a lot of time barbecuing and trying to figure out what was next um, in the in the horizon for him and. Uh, him and Dan started texting each other. We'd all worked together previously at Google. Uh, Dan and I were working together at Google at the time, him on the engineering side, me on the product side. And I think the two of them kicked off the conversation. They're like, hey, what are you doing next? And then one thing led to another. Uh, we, we saw the opportunity uh, to help companies uh, with their software supply chains and help secure them. We'd started several of the, the projects that we'll probably talk about today in the open source yep. community to help help with this issue and then uh yeah one thing led to another and we kicked off the company we're about a year old today nice um and we're calling from all over the u.s today uh west coast east coast we've got equal representation here um and we've got people in chat from all over the world we got germany we got netherlands um Evidently, this is a good time to have a live show when you're in Europe. <laughs> Everybody's at the end of their day. Uh, Eric's back, Kamajaru, all the way from India. Thanks, everyone, for being here. All right, so we've got this idea around supply chain. This is kind of the title. And Dan, can you break down what is and isn't? I think, actually, I care more about what isn't in a software supply chain. What, when you think of that, what is that exactly? <laughs> You said what isn't in it? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. What isn't in the supply chain? <laughs> Hardware is not in the software supply chain. Um, All right. That's a <laughs> great answer. That's only answer. partially true, too. Um, no, it's a, it's a kind of funny joke, too. We get we get tons of random emails and marketing and sales and VCs reaching out thinking that we're making software for physical supply chains um, to help secure those. Physical mm. supply chains are also a mess in the last couple of years during the pandemic. Right. So that's also a very hot field, but um, uh, we're doing the other one. So we are doing security for software supply chains. So you're so not includes... a bunch of security, physical security guards that stand next to buildings made, so... making software. You don't do that. It's a okay. different kind of containers that they're worried about. I'm sure you get a lot of these, this confusion too. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Sorry, I interrupted you. Please continue. Oh. Um, yeah, so software supply chain is basically all of the 
code, all of the third party code, all of the first party code written to your company, all the tools you use to build all of that, everything going back to kind of the, the first tool used to build up all of your tool chains all the way out until your code makes it to production. Everybody has one. Uh, most people couldn't write down the entire thing. I often like to think of this as like one of those fun interview questions. You know, they used to ask, type google.com into your browser, press enter, explain what happens. Um, I think, you know, you could do a similar one of like, there are containers with Kubernetes in them uh, on the internet. Walk back as far as you can to how those got there and all of the people that were involved in that process. And I think it would really scare a lot of folks when they realize exactly how many steps and people they're trusting in that process. Yeah, that I, I love that you're pointing out like it is actually pretty common for us to uh, very few people to actually know everything in that in that workflow. I always we've talked about on the show often that most people don't know all their dependencies. Like they just they don't even realize all the complexity that goes into their app needing things. Um, so when we talk about supply chain, it, and I mean, there's there's concepts, there's there are things that we, those of us that are trying to pay attention to security expect you to do. Um, for those that are getting started with this, what, what are the, some of the things that you, when you first walk into a company that's like, help us secure things, like help us make it better, what are some of the first things that you all are looking at? Yeah, I think there's a lot of noise going on in this field in the last couple of years, uh, especially because of all of the high profile attacks. And I think that's generated a lot of confusion and folks are worried about a lot of things. I think the biggest worry we often hear is about the security of open source code and attacks like uh, you know, a lot of the attacks that are triggered after the log for shell uh, vulnerability in log4j um, help bring that stuff to the spotlight. But I think where we try to get folks to start out is actually, you know, inside of your own organization, inside of your own company, there's a whole supply chain uh, there too. And getting your own house in order, figuring out how your builds happen, which teams are responsible, who has root permissions to, you know, push to these artifact managers goes a long way and it helps you figure out which external dependencies you actually have. So that way you can start to secure those. So we like to start out internally, I think, and then work our way backwards. Nice. Um, some of this was, uh, I was just going to add, like, yeah. so you're asking about the origin, like some of this, like, I think inspired Dan back in the day when he was building like mini cube under his desktop <laughs> and, and realizing that, you know, this is, a, this is a, a piece of software that's going out and running his route to a bunch of, to a bunch of people. And, you know, this is a machine under my desktop that we haven't secured or done it, haven't done anything with. And so that's, that's a good place where we see, um, for folks to start kind of taking a look at is just their build systems. Like how is that thing being treated? Yeah, for sure. That it seems like one of the weak areas uh, and based on the, pre the last few years of vulnerability announcements and corporate disclosures, it seems like that's a, a common attack area too, is just exactly, we, I, I personally see a lot of sort of legacy what i would call legacy at this point legacy build systems or things that they're they're almost like it's not broke so don't touch it <laughs> right it's still it still builds so we don't have to really know what it does just leave it alone and um it's kind of been of a, a theme of mine this year is to rant to people on the internet about you know let's let's modernize this let's maybe bring in new tools to replace the tools and maybe update a lot of this code because I think a lot of this stuff can go back, especially on these monoliths, like going back years, possibly over a decade for how they get their software out of a dev's hands and onto a server and how, and how in the world does anyone account for all those steps and ensure integrity and all that stuff that we, we can get into. Um, when you talk about a lot of this stuff, so on the chain guard website, by the way, I just want to mention there's a, I read this this week. <laughs> By the way, well done on the title, all about that base um, <laughs> image. Uh, so if everyone wants to go, you can go to chainguard.dev and you can actually uh, view a white paper. It's actually, I feel like this is like a manifesto of mine a little bit because it, it I'm just going to put this in the chat for people that are watching. It's a, it's a long URL. Um, but that paper is talks about a lot of the problems that I'm passionate about, about base images and that how it, like your security that's one of the places you start is that do you is that how you approach this like it's, obviously there's lots of other complexities and things but this is like one of the areas you focus on yeah the base image is kind of that the first piece of code you grab when you're developing in a containerized environment that from line in your docker file 
Uh, and there's a lot of choices, and it's not always clear where the base image you grab is coming from. A lot of organizations will try to maintain their own golden base image, uh, but they're usually not building these from scratch themselves. They're usually grabbing another one and then throwing some of their custom stuff on top of it, which is great, but the more of those you have and the more layers there are, the longer it takes for security fixes to percolate their way from you know, the upstream package distribution you're using, then to the base image uh, on Docker Hub, and then into your organization's base image, and then out to your application. Each one of those hops can take weeks, which causes a whole bunch of noise when you start doing stuff like vulnerability scans on your containers. Yeah. And you talk a lot about that in there, about the noise of just managing the chaos of vulnerabilities in your software. And um, I, I think I, in my DockerCon talk this year, I kind of ranted about that if, if the count of total vulnerabilities that a team is trying to manage is over 20, I feel like that just doesn't happen. Like I don't, 20 isn't a magic number, but when you scan and you get 50, no one deals with that real well, right. <laughs> if at all, right? Yeah, there's a common criticism when we talk about this too. Like, well, how many of those are real? You know, a lot of these aren't actually going to affect you and only like one percent or two percent of all the cvs in the wild can actually be exploited and a bunch of stuff like that but still when there's 50 or 100 or 200 to your point um how do you know which one in there is the one that's going to affect you um it's much better to be at a place with the quiet i, I think in the, that paper we use the term quiet base images much better to be in a place where there's a quiet one and the alert when the alert does go off you know it's something real and your team addresses it it's just like right. noisy alerting in you know, production hygiene. You don't have alerts and pagers that go off constantly because people get numb to those effects and stop paying attention when there is a real outage. I like to think of these vulnerability alerts the same way. I'm imagining that uh, uh, Big Lebowski meme of, well, that's like your opinion, man, because that's <laughs> that basically sums up every conversation that I have with people around scanners and vulnerabilities is we all end up with opinions about what's a real threat, threat, what's not, what these numbers mean, what they don't mean, why two scanners are different numbers, right? Which scanner do we trust? Um, which vulnerabilities do we pay attention to? And and there's, there's a lot of complexity. We've had multiple shows this year. We've had Slim, uh, the Slim, Docker Slim team, uh, Slim.ai on talking about trying to shrink down your images. And you all announced this, well, actually last month, this sort of, Something that I feel like should have happened years ago, and I'm very excited about. So, could someone like give me the elevator pitch uh, for Wolfie? Great name. Had no idea that it was a tiny, a tiny octopus, right? Isn't that what it means, yeah. or something? I had no yeah. idea. Um, what does it mean to be an undistro, and what problems is this trying to solve? Sure. Um, I think you, before we got on, you started chatting a bit about your DockerCon talk. Now you went through all the base images and there's problems with all of them and none are perfect. And you kind of have to pick your, choose your poison or whatever the term is there. Um, with Wolfie, we try to take a step back and figure out like, what would be an ideal Linux distribution for containers? Um, you know, containers have one now, they're everywhere, whether you know, folks realize it or not. Um, and nobody's really tried try to think through Linux distributions and what they would look like if you just assume containers are everywhere. Uh, Docker files were amazing. You know, when Docker first came out, there were a way to get every you know, Linux distribution, existing ones, into containers and give people a familiar environment. But nobody took advantage of that yet on the Linux distribution side. Yeah. So that's Wolfie. Wolfie is our Linux distribution where we rebuilt it from scratch. Um, every package comes from us. We are the upstream. Like We're not building on top of an existing one. We build all of the packages ourselves. We try to combine all of the you know, existing, the good parts of all of the existing distributions for containers. I like to think of it as kind of a, a mixture of Alpine, Debian, and DistroList, like the good parts of all of them uh, without any of the bad parts. Um, I basically, when this came out, I realized I was going to have to update that talk in that GitHub repo because <laughs> I did I did all that analysis of like Distro versus Ubuntu versus or DistroList rather versus Ubuntu and the pros and cons and the a point in time CVE count of all these different ways to build images and most people I'm just going to paint a brush over most people don't have that kind of patience like I do like they will not that this is not a work that they enjoy doing. And it's to me, to many people, it's like plumbing, right? It's just like, I just want to, someone to tell me this is fine. And I just need to move on because it doesn't, it's not my app. It's not the reason I, I exist as a team or as a company usually. Um, why? I love that you talk, I'll call it a distro by the way, because it it's to me, that means it kind of legitimizes it as this real independent thing, not just 
a rehash of something because we've had lots of these ideas, right? We've had uh, build packs. We've had so many different ideas around how do we get the right things in our software and ship it to the server. And I feel like so many of those are either, they're either really, they're super, they're super, they claim to be super secure, but they're really challenging to deal with and they're a little esoteric and they're kind of edge case and it's hard to convince people to use it or it's popular it's huge and it's full of vulnerabilities and i feel like there's not really a happy medium and i'm 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 rooting for you and wolfie for that sort of middle of the road approach of solves most problems easy comes out near zero or zero v cves like that that seems like a utopia um can you tell me like how does exactly does the pa do the packages get in there? I'm, is it you? It sounds like it uses APK. That's the Alpine Package Manager for those listening. Um, yeah. So there were, there were a couple of questions in the chat too, and I realized I forgot to answer your one about undistro. So I'll do that first. And yeah, and then you said oh, call it a distro, but it's kind of an undistro. Um, you know, a Linux distribution traditionally is a whole bunch of packages and then Linux. If you've ever seen that whole meme of like, you know, actually what you're referring to is Linux, is the GNU slash Linux thing. And, you know, that's actually correct. You know, in most cases and you're not using Linux, you're using the Linux kernel plus a bunch of packages that come from someone else. Um, in this case, those packages come from us, right? We build them from source. It's a good example there is OpenSSL, right? When you grab OpenSSL in Debian or Ubuntu or Alpine, you're not getting that directly from the OpenSSL maintainers. You're getting that from a distribution, which has taken the OpenSSL source code, applied a couple patches, whether they're security or customization or something like that, and then thrown that into their package manager. In this case, we're the ones that do that. We take the, the upstream source code, build that, and put that into our packages, which, um, like you said, yeah, they're APKs, uh, packages from the um, Alpine package manager. That's the format we use. Just like Ubuntu and Debian both use the .deb package format, you know, we use the, the APK one here. Yeah. The undistro yeah. part, though, is because we don't actually package Linux. Um, that's that's my take on it. You know, it's a container. Containers right. don't have a Linux kernel inside of it. So it's a distribution. It's a Linux distribution without the Linux. So it's not technically correct to call it a distribution. Um, it's everything except for Linux. Um, so that's why we call it an undistro. It does get us into the what is Linux conversation, which yeah. we're going to skip. But uh, those of us that have been around a while, you know, is it the kernel? Is it the distribution? Is it all the other? Is it the package manager? Is it, Yeah. And, and these are things that like a lot of developers just don't want to mess with, right? Like they don't even distinguish the difference between a kernel and a package manager and a distribution. And which is fine. Like I, I actually, I'm okay with that because yeah. not everyone needs to, like the goal now, I mean, it's, we should be able to let an engineer develop software and not have to know how to build their own kernel. It wasn't true 20 years ago, <laughs> but you know, uh, we've moved on. And with this, it sounds like you you're declarative by out front right like i think it's like yaml based or something like people add their packages and because that's one of my big beefs too is that i don't have a good apt process like i do for package json for node.js i don't have a very clear way to add packages to my os and it's always been a big beef of mine so i feel like this might check off multiple boxes like not only is it start out cve low or zero it's got a declarative way of setting packages which i didn't have before um, and you're doing all of that. You're packaging. So does that mean like every APK package that is in Alpine is in Wolfie? So we're packaging them all ourselves. We don't have everything though, right? And okay. This is one of the benefits of doing our own distro. Um, you know, we don't have desktop packages, right? We don't have uh, okay. you know, the, the, the kernel packages. We Drivers. don't have all the stuff to run it in other environments, right. right? This is really container centric today, right? You know, it can expand, we can add more packages over time. But if you just look at the subset of packages that get installed in containers and are appropriate for server side environments, right? you get to skip GTK, you get to skip KDE, you get to skip all of the stuff that gets pulled in in a desktop environment. Um, right. And it, it makes the problem a lot easier. The declarative piece too is interesting. These are most traditional package managers are designed for these uh, long running bare metal server environments where stuff gets installed and certain versions get pinned and other packages get upgraded and you can't lose data through throughout any of that time. Uh, but in containers, you don't ever actually patch things. You just delete the container image and build a new one from scratch. And so the package manager, if you design it for this world is actually a lot simpler. You don't have to deal with any of the state transformations or complex upgrade, downgrade version conflict scenarios. So you can make something a lot faster, a lot simpler, and uh, a lot easier at the same time. Yeah. Um, and 
we could, I mean, honestly, we could have made this whole show about base images because I, I made a whole DockerCon talk about Let's it. Keep going. Let's keep yeah. Going. yeah. Um, it, it's very compelling. So I'm basically telling people in chat, like, check out Wolfie. Uh, the, a lot of this is open source, right? So I'm trying to figure out what, like, Wolfie, the idea is open source, but you only have so many base images to start or something like that, or so many designs or pre built images. Yeah, so the way it works is there's a whole package. There, there's a repo. It's um, github.com slash wolfie hyphen dev slash OS. Um, and that repo contains all of the packages that we have, right? And those are built using our own tooling as well. So it's more YAML um, because you need YAML to be cloud native. Um, and <laughs> Heard it here first, people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can find the YAML file we use to build OpenSSL and the YAML file we use to build Python and all of that. And that uses another custom tool we wrote called Melange, um, which is the sports reproducible builds and cross compilation and all of that by default. Yeah, so each one of these YAML files is a single package. There's a lot in there. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, you have to scroll all the way down. But you can add a new package here with a new YAML file. Um, and these then become part of the distribution. You can install these packages that get built using our build system and signed um, and all of that fun stuff and uploaded. Then, um, like this is just kind of, you know, the package repository. Then these actually get used in images. Um, and that's the whole suite of chain guard images that we build from the Wolfie distribution. Um, and so that's another series of GitHub repositories. <laughs> um, but that's, uh, yeah, chainyard, uh, github.com, chainyard images, and then you'll find one for Nginx, one for Python, one for all this other stuff built using um, uh, our actual image composition tool called Apco. And uh, yeah, those are, again, a YAML file each with a list of the packages that you need in there, um, all of the other kind of Docker file metadata. And because this is all declarative and simple and we're not running compilation and stuff as part of it, um, you don't need Docker to build these things. You don't need any privileged environment. You can just create these images super quick in any CI system. You don't need to do any of the Docker host path mounting to get it inside of a container or privilege mode or any of that stuff. You can go right from YAML to image in a registry reproducibly and quickly. Yeah, so well, that, we're also creating. Here. That's, 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 that's really interesting. I have so many questions on that, but sorry, what were you saying, Kim? I was just going to say, we're also creating the SBOM file. I don't know if you've covered SBOMs on this show before, but so we're creating those right at the build time because we know exactly what's going into these images and um, the SBOM can be used later. For other yeah, things. very nice. <laughs> I, we, I'm, I definitely know that we've talked about it. I think we talked about it maybe when Docker added it to their command line for yeah. Docker desktop because that was kind of like, it's been around for a long time and I, I work in an area where we have 12 military bases. So government knows all about supply chain <laughs> Uh, build the materials and all that stuff, uh, but yeah, the rest of the I think the rest of the software world is sort of coming coming into that that world and realizing that that's a necessary thing for auditing and compliance and stuff like that. Um, but that's really cool because I I think we're all looking for easier ways to build our images and um, also I don't know anyone that hasn't probably asked me at some point whether it was a, in a consulting gig or in class where they're like, how do I make my image smaller? How do I make it safe and secure and how do i figure out what's insecure about it and i feel like this hits a lot of those different points so um maybe we'll have to have like a wolfy you know when when there's a major another major announcement we'll have a wolfy show um <laughs> and because this is the thing close to my heart and i and i feel like uh maybe someday i just need to delete that talk i did at docker con about all the shitty underlayers of all the things i was trying just to just do and just say add a slide at the end yeah just use wolfy <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert, uh, you could have done all that or you could have just done this one thing. Um, yeah, because most people aren't going to do that. Now, there's this other thing on your website that I'm very interested about as well, uh, Chain Guard Enforce. So, Kim, what um, this sounds like something that I want, um, <laughs> but what exactly would like Git Enforce, what is that all about? Like, what are we, what are we doing here with Git and Kubernetes and stuff with this? Yeah, so Chain Guard Enforce is a whole um, risk uh, platform for big organizations or any organization. So one good use case is assume you decided to use Wolfie or uh, one of these hardened base images. You want to make sure that that's actually what's being enforced and going into your production system. So you could use Chain Guard Enforce to set up that rule. Um, we check the rule and then throw an alert or block, block the um, deployment from going out. And so it's kind of like we're we're chain the chain guard images. We're starting all the way towards the is it the left? 
yeah, the left of the supply chain, <laughs> you know, where, where the developers are and chain garden forces sitting more on the right right now. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of different use cases around maybe just signing. We haven't talked about signing too much, but, um, signing's an important thing, uh, it's coming either from developer signatures or for that build system. Maybe you've hardened and you want to make sure only uh, certain things get deployed that have been built by a hardened build system and signed by that build system. So you could, uh, write that policy up and enforce it. Uh, the one the one cool feature about Chain Garden Force too is we have it's running um, what we call continuous verification. So it's not just that deploy time check. So a lot of things, a lot of times we see what's happening is like you'll scan for vulnerabilities. You you want to make sure there's no crit critical vulnerabilities being deployed, but then but then you forget about it after it's running like in production. So, or maybe, maybe you have something running in production that hasn't been rebuilt in six months. Um, and so, you know, you want to, you want to send an alert or uh, have some functionality that, that makes you rebuild images, for example, to get like the latest packages. So it's not only just doing the deploy time checks, but, but watching what's happening in, in your running environments too. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think that that's, like it's, it almost feels like a maturity model of the the first thing I do is I add an image scanner, but it's usually only during build time or maybe when it's pushed at, to a to a registry. And maybe I'm lucky enough that I actually eventually get a registry that has built in auto scanning on a regular basis, and it and it and then eventually people get to okay now we're going to be looking at our servers in real time and scanning that stuff. Does that is that how you normally see these things progress? Where like production scanning is maybe like intermediate level yeah i think i mean we're trying to tackle the entire supply chain too so have checks along that of course the whole shift left thing so try to catch as, as things early as we can before you even progress through like the supply chain um yeah so what is is in force okay so to chain guard in force is this this is a beta i think we, i asked before the show this is a beta that people can sign up for yeah, so it's. I think it's in GA. Maybe we need to update the, update the website. But we have a free trial program. You have to fill out a form today, and then we create an invite code tied to your email address, and then you can kick the tires for thirty days. Uh, the onboarding process goes through uh, using an unkind, so doing like a local development, kind of creating one of those policies, um, enforcing it, seeing how it runs, and then uh, yeah, if you if you like what you see or have feedback, definitely reach out. Um, yeah, the forms on the on the site. I'd say one other yeah cool feature uh, that we could, we could chat about about this is is one of the big problems that we see we talked about this early is is people don't know what's running in their production systems so enforce actually gives you a view of everything that's running and then you can start tracing things back if it's signed like where exactly it came from which repo did this come from what developers committed code to this uh, and some of the added benefits are that or when you see a big <clears throat> breach. I think the log for J log for shell is a, is the one example I like to use is people don't even know if they were impacted. They don't know if that thing was running in their production systems. So then the time to remediation was weeks, if not like still unknown if, if people are impacted by that. So with chain guard and forest, like we have this view now of actually what's running in all the clusters. So remediation becomes like a matter of seconds versus uh, having an entire team scrape their GitHub UI to see if log4j appears anywhere in their source repository. Right. Yeah, especially, I mean, Git, I always find that GitHub's pretty challenging when, when you're talking about dozens of repos, especially now that we're doing infrastructure as code and maybe you're throwing your automation YAML in there with the repos and trying to get a sense of what do, what do I have that eventually makes itself to production. And sometimes I feel like, yeah, just scanning production, even though I consider it an advanced thing, it might just be the easiest thing to do. Um, long, I think we've kind of a lot of, you know, 15 years ago, I felt like we were, we were putting scanning software scanners on servers as a part of a security requirement from security team and containers. I feel like maybe got us out of that a little bit. I don't know. Maybe teams are, always, are still doing it, but uh, I felt like a lot of people were like, well, it's contained. So maybe we don't need these scanners scanning and, and then of course we didn't have those tools yet i guess at the beginning of the docker evolution we didn't really have good tools to see what's in all the containers um we've got some questions they're pretty we're got we got some people on that know what they're talking about because there's some pretty uh -oh. good uh, pretty pretty good te technical <laughs> questions andy's asking um could you discuss how chain guard and the cosine distroless images can be used with in toto i can't find a lot of information on using in toto run 
uh, with a pipeline to generate and sign provenance. Um, yeah, I can try to take that one. Um, so Intoto is a project in the CNCF uh, around supply chain security. It's been around for a while since before okay. the topic got, got cool. Um, and uh, Intoto has a couple different concepts, uh, but one of them is called uh, attestations. Um, this is a, basically, you can think of it as a file format that contains a bunch of metadata about what happens inside of a build. Mm. Um, I say, they, I think that I'm terrible at vocabulary, but I, it, it contains the inputs, the step that gets run, and then the outputs. So you might say, my inputs were this Git repository at this commit. Um, I ran make foo inside of that, and then I got this binary at the end with this hash or something like that. Um, and you can define an Intoto pipeline that says these are the three or four steps that must be run. This one has to be done by Brett, and then he hands me a repo, and I run another command to validate the test pass, and then I give that to Kim, and she does the final production deployment or something like that. You can write this in what's called an Intoto layout file, um, saying that is how our artifacts make it to production. And then if you instrument your build system, like GitHub Actions or Jenkins or something, to capture those steps, you get these um, actual attestations saying what happened. And then you can validate that using Intoto. And then, like that Intoto run thing is usually the, the step that actually captures that metadata and produces uh, you know, the Intoto, the set of Intoto attestations that you can validate to make sure the, the right set of steps were followed. Um, we produce those in Toto attestations uh, for the distributed images that we build. Um, they're called provenance uh, files. That's the, the type of format that we use. You can have a whole bunch of different types. You can have test runs yeah. or scans or security analysis or something. Uh, the ones specific to build are called provenance attestations. Uh, but then it's up to you to kind of write those into your policy and decide if uh, that's those are just one of the steps that might happen in your pipeline. And then yeah. use Chain Garden Force. <laughs> <laughs> and use chain kind of for, is that the easy, are we going to say that's the easy button for uh implementing these things <laughs> i mean that's why we built it it's like you, yeah. you gotta define all these different things that you trust in your environments but then you need a way to kind of bring down the hammer and make sure that that's what you're following yeah that's i mean i don't really have a go-to set of tools for recommending like after you after you image scan and after you lock down maybe some like infrastructure as code tools so that people can't just do whatever they want on servers that it, it there was this idea that there was going to be a push it was going to be push button easy to prevent unsigned images from being in production or like some sort of validation there is that something that has gotten easier i haven't really I basically i'm not up to date and i need help um is there is there a specific tool that's used here or is it just enforce adds kubernetes functionality or a, What's going on here? Like, give me the details. <laughs> How do I prevent these from getting in, uh, onto production? These, you know, maybe vulnerable images or unsigned images or whatever. What's going on there? Uh, so yeah, there's a bunch of different things you could control for, and every organization is set up a little bit different. But kind of step one when somebody rolls out something like Chain Garden for us is you, you install it into your cluster and it looks at what's running. Um, and by default, all you see is you know that container image which is like a long url and a hash and you know most tools kind of stop there at the level right. of visibility they have there's a bunch of examples of you know showing how to control that stuff came from the right registry and you know maybe you have like a, a little regex saying only let stuff that comes from my ecr or gcr bucket um make it to prod um but enforce can look farther than that right you can think of just looking inside of the container and then joining up with other data uh, to see how it got there so you would then instrument your build system and install like a GitHub Actions plugin or a Jenkins plugin or a Circle CI plugin or whatever build system you're using. Um, and then now we can see the container digest and we can see a bunch of information about where containers were built. And you can then restrict not just to you know the registry that something happens to live in. If you pull one thing from Docker Hub and now you've opened up all of Docker Hub or something, um, you can restrict to what build system was used to build something. And so earlier on, you were talking about legacy build systems and stuff like that. Folks have hundreds, you know, thousands of build systems at some large companies, and there's new ones being created every day and shut down every day. And that sprawl is a pretty big problem. Um, so you typically want to have a few highly secure build systems rather than tons of not secured ones. Uh, so at that point, you figure out all the build system stuff is coming from and then start to put in policies in place. So stuff can't come from the internet. A developer can't have the wrong coop control context set up and accidentally deploy a Helm chart they meant to put into Minikube or Docker desktop straight into production by accident. 
um, only stuff that's been through those steps and been vetted by your CI pipeline can make it to prod. And this all works with capturing all of this like in Toto style provenance and attestation metadata automatically for you. Um, so you can see exactly which commit stuff was built at, exactly which version of the dependencies are inside of your production containers, and then block vulnerable stuff when it gets found later. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. The block, the blocking being the the primary purpose here. The um, I think the idea of okay, so let me back up. Are, what do you you said you mentioned scanning on servers? Is this like a trivi scan? It, it sounds like there's a little a lot more than that going on, but. Are you picking industry scanners for like CV stuff? Yeah, so there, there's sort of this shift happening with S bombs, um, where you know S bombs contain the list of everything inside of you know, a binary, a service, a container, or something like that. And so the role of scanners is starting to change a little bit. You know, scanners kind of before did two things: they would you point it at a container, it would crawl through that figure out everything that they could find in there, whether it's packages, go binaries, jar files, something like that. Um, and then they would take that information and query a bunch of like CVE or vulnerability databases. SBOMs kind of let you skip that first step, right? If the person yeah. giving you the software tells you what's inside of it, um, you don't need to guess anymore. You don't need to like crack the thing open and look around and compare hashes and everything. Um, you can still do that. You can still look for stuff that's not found. But um, you know, SBOMs sort of short circuit that process. So a lot of these scanners now let you just pass in an SBOM instead of passing in a container. Because um, the end result is you just want to know, are there any vulnerabilities inside of this stuff? Um, and so if you get a really good SBOM from the person that built the software, because they know exactly what was in there, then you can skip the scanning portion and just go right to kind of querying these vulnerability databases. So yeah, we support you know, the all the stuff really comes from the National Vulnerability Database, the NVD for the most part, right. which is like the center sort of source of truth for CVEs. It just turns out that's really hard to query. So there's a bunch of like indexes that other folks like you know, Trivi and Gripe and Sneak have built up on top of that to let you query it in more friendly ways. So we support all of those. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. I'm glad you pointed that out because yeah, if we're all if it's if it's all read only. Uh, ideally, we don't have to go in there and rescan all the time, right? right. Uh, and of course, yeah, SHA hashes to mean nothing to me. So a lot of times, looking staring at API stuff doesn't doesn't mean a whole lot. And um, and I think that that's one of my pet peeves is you know a lot of times these tools I don't they're not actionable to me, right? Like I I do a thing, I get back a bunch of information, and I don't know what to do with it, <laughs> whether it's an S bomb or whether it's a CVE vulnerability list or um, I don't know. Whatever other scanner possible information could come out of there, they all provide a ton of information that I'm. Is it going to change my behavior? Is it going to change my ability to go to my manager and say we have zero CVEs found on our production servers? Like you know, that's an amazing day that I want to go brag about to my boss. But like, how do I get there? That's always a tough. It's an always a tough sell. I think there's a question. John's kind of dancing around a question in chat. Um, I think what he was asking about was um, Amazon Linux images and maybe some of the support Wolfie for, would have for that. But to me, Wolfie, it would be, tell me if I'm wrong, like Wolfie would be the thing I would use instead of that, right? Like I wouldn't use their base images anymore. I would use Wolfie base images. Um, it probably depends on exactly which Amazon Linux stuff you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, right? Amazon has... AMI is with Amazon Linux that boot up on the VM or, you know, to get you into your container. So if you run like start up an EC2 instance, it's going to have Amazon Linux on it. And then from there, you might have Docker and then you still need to put something inside of the Docker daemon or inside of the container. Yeah. I think they also do have like AMI or sorry, not AMI, um, Amazon Linux container images. So yeah, you would use Wolfie instead of that. Um, a good example is like Bottle Rocket. Um, that's Amazon's like super lightweight OS for booting up into a container D or container runtime environment. Um, that's the thing that runs inside of Firecracker or some other virtual machine or, or VM instance. Um, so you, if you have you know, Bottle Rocket or uh, Flatcar Linux or something like that running on the host, then you would run Wolfie inside of the container runtime on that. So it's somewhat complementary, um, somewhat of a replacement for once you get inside of the container image. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that like I, I can see the complexity of people thinking about okay, how do I how do I get my images to take advantage of these things? And yeah, base images are going to have to change. In fact, I'm when I one of the things that got me excited 
people who have been here before know I have an opinion about Alpine. <laughs> I love the I love the low CVE count of Alpine. I love the I, but it's got rough edges, right? Like old packages aren't on the package managers. I, I have a hard time, you know, keeping things building over that are aging. Um, and I have had I have had numerous production outages because of changes with using Musil instead of glibc and just some of the little quirks around Alpine and BusyBox that are just what I would say maybe edge case scenarios. And one of the things that excited me about it was you said you support both glibc and Musil. I hope I'm saying that right. I've heard it say Musil. I used to yeah, I used to I, say it I as an acronym. Yeah. <laughs> also um, Musil. Yeah. yeah. So could you tell people like the significance of that? Um, I. I I'm not the super nerdy guy into exactly the difference between all of those, but like, how, how is this different than maybe just a stock Alpine image? Yeah, so uh, Musil and glibc are two common libc implementations, probably the, the two biggest ones out there. Um, libc is kind of this shim layer uh, for folks that don't know quite what it is. It's this shim layer that interacts with the actual kernel or the operating system. Um, so programs are somewhat portable across Linux, Unix, you know, these other uh, POSIX compatible operating systems uh, because they don't talk to the kernel directly for the most part. They use uh, a libc implementation to do all of that. Um, and there's a few different libcs and there's a whole specification that explains how libcs are supposed to operate called the POSIX specification. Uh, but as all specifications go, some things are underdefined, some things are overdefined. You can follow all the rules, even the ones that conflict with the other rules. And so they're not as swappable as you would think. Um, and so yeah, Musil is an implementation that's in Alpine. Um, it's very small, it's lightweight, it's, uh, it doesn't have um, all of the backwards compatibility stuff inside of it that glibc does. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not as common as glibc in the wild today. Um, and so it's one of these cases where a lot of the things that are implementation defined or maybe even in violation of the specification, depending on exactly what you're looking at, um, are really just understood to be bugs when, you know, even though some of them might not be. Um, the reality is that you want to have, for the most part, bug for bug compatibility with glibc if you want to, uh, you know, run the majority of applications out there today. So I'm guessing that's some of the stuff you ran into with Alpine. Um, there are benefits to using Musil, but it does come with a lot of those rough edges. Um, and so we support both, and actually glibc is kind of the primary um, build target that we have in Wolfie right now. So that's why I said we, it's kind of a combination of Debian, Distrolis, and Alpine, where we, you know, we add glibc support to all the packages that we build. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like it could be the most universal image base uh, that I've ever used. Where do people get started with Wolfie? So it sounds like there's a base image they can start with. You mentioned building without Docker. Is that true for my own images? Like, can I build a, my Node.js app into an image on top of Wolfie without needing Docker build? It depends on the programming language. Um, okay. you know, there's we uh, For Node, maybe, you know, um, there, there are a couple tools out there now that folks are working on. Uh, the challenge there is a lot of the node dependencies also have native code inside of them. And so if you're trying to do an NPM install on your Mac, yeah, we could turn that into a Docker image for you, but it might not work if you've got some C libraries that haven't been cross compiled correctly or something. Like right. That. There's some techniques you can do, but I'm, I'm not aware of any, uh, node ones that are that far along there. Yeah. Uh, but for Go or Java, for example, there are actually some really good tools that let you take your application code and stick that onto an existing base image without Docker. Yeah. Um, just running natively. So that's the, the Co or KO tool for Go. Um, if you're building a Go application, um, you should just stop what you're doing and switch to use K KO or Co for, for the builds. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, and then Jib for Java, J-I-B or Java Image Builder can do the same thing uh, for Java apps. And there's a few others for different programming languages. Uh, but for our base images themselves, we use Apco, kind of named after Co, but APKO, um, which, you know, because the packages are all built statically and cross compile and there aren't crazy init scripts that run at install time or anything. We just grab those packages, the ones for the right platform, stitch those together using your containers are basically just tarballs and JSON at the end of the day mm -hmm. um, and stitch together those tarballs and that JSON and get you your runnable image directly from that YAML file. So if you want to get started up uh, for the most part, you should just grab a built image. So they're all sitting in our registry and you can find the links um, in that GitHub organization. But um, yeah, if you've got a, if you just want to run Nginx, we have a full Nginx image that you can just grab. Um, you can see the CV counts and daily builds and everything on that one. Um, or if you have your own application, then you could just take your Docker file, switch the from line and the rest should just work. 
So our product chain guard images is we want to take the burden off corporations dealing with this. So we offer kind of support packages, SLAs around patching, we rebuild nightly, and then, yeah, trying to relieve some of the burden off folks. So the, so the chain guard images organization on GitHub is the instructions and a set of images built by Wolfie and these other APKO and Melange tools. Is that yeah, so if you click on repository. Yeah, so if you click on repositories, we could probably look at an example. Let's make it more clear. Um, yeah, let's see. There we go. Um, yeah, so these are all the different images we build from here. So if you yeah, keep scrolling down, we'll find something a little easier. Yeah, PHP, for example, or Go, or you know, if, if, if you click on that, any one of these kind of language images, it should be pretty easy to understand. Yeah, so this is all of the code we need to build the PHP base image itself with no Docker or anything inside of it. So if you click on that YAML file, this shows all the different tags we spit out. Uh, but this is it. This is the APKO configuration. Um, so you're adding package repositories. Um, you put the packages themselves you want there in lines six, seven, and eight. Um, and that's it. We set up the groups, set up environment variables, that kind of thing. And then you do an APKO build on this YAML file and tell it where to put it and you get your image. Um, so this one, because we use uh, APKs, um, the Alpine packages, you can point this at the Wolfie repositories or you know, standard stock Alpine repositories. So this one looks like it's pointed right at Alpine directly. So it grabs the Alpine packages. This is actually really cool stuff. I'm, I'm a little quiet because I'm thinking like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna use this on my next project? <laughs> uh, so this is really cool. Um, I, and I want, and I, I'm just actually surprised why we haven't had something that is this well thought out uh you know why did it take eight years of the docker of the docker world for us to figure some of this stuff out i think i don't know we, we're set, we're all set in our ways i'm gonna i'm gonna answer my own question um eric is here uh he he's sneaking in from sneak uh has some security questions can you take can you talk a bit about the new v extol is that how i'm gonna say that vextol yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next little tool on how you see it being used in a secure SDLC. We were trying to come up with all the different pronunciations we could for this one just to make it extra controversial, and you just came up with a new yes. one on your first try. I no! Yes! That. <laughs> Vextel. Perfect. That's what I'm going to go with from now on. Vextel. I, I, um, I've said it on the internet, so it's now an official way. Because it's now it's far on the internet forever, so it's fine. Vextel. Awesome. Yeah, right, so how, do you, how do you say it? How do you say it? No, I'm, this is it for me now. This is it. Um, Vex cuddle, Vex control. You know, there's a lot. Um, Vex yeah, so uh, yeah. Vex CTL, something like that. Um, Vex is a new emerging standardy thing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it stands for. It was named for vulnerability exchange, um, and I like to think of it as complementary to S bombs. Um, so S bombs are starting to come. They're showing up in government regulations. They're going to be here. Docker added the S bomb tool, etc. Um, and they're great, right? s are awesome. They give you transparency and all of the dependencies inside of your code. Um, but then the first thing anybody that gets an SBOM is going to do, obviously, is scan it with something like Sneak or a different scanner, and then get you know 500 or 1,000 vulnerabilities back and just be absolutely terrified. So they ask their vendor for software. The vendor gives them software. They ask their vendor for the SBOM. The vendor gives them the SBOM. And then they just start complaining and sending tons of emails to the vendor saying, why isn't this patched? What are all these things doing? And uh, like, so transparency is coming, transparency is good, but that's kind of going to be the drawback here because the vulnerability scans are so noisy. Um, and, you know, it's no one person's fault. The national vulnerability database doesn't always contain good information. A lot of the vulnerabilities in there are noisy and not that important. Um, and so VEX is kind of the answer to that problem is how I like to think about it. Um, a vendor, in addition to the SBOM uh, information, can provide a VEX feed or a VEX document or a set of VEX documents um, that have a list of all of the vulnerabilities that scanners show in that package, and then their evaluation of it. Um, and so when a CV gets found in an image, the vendor can look at that, triage it, and say, oh, that one doesn't affect us uh, for XYZ reason, and then publish that in a feed. So if you take your image, the SBOM, the sneak feed, or whatever vulnerability scanner you're using, and then the VEX feed from the vendor, you should be able to get down to only the vulnerabilities you actually care about, provided the vendor is mm. sending those things to you. Um, so VEX is, I think, the first tool we, we published it a couple weeks ago, the first tool to actually publish and allow you to consume and to join that data with your CVE feeds. 
Very cool. Um, Eric is always one upping my knowledge. <laughs> I keep the smart people around in chat. <laughs> thanks, Eric. Um, and, and thanks for being a supporter. So, uh, what, okay, so we've got secure images. We've got some other tooling. We've got this uh, enforced product that people can sign up for and get a demo. Um, is there any sort of, we're, we're wrapping up the show a little bit, but I wanted to give some like, are there any hot takes? Are there any uh, <laughs> next actions for people or things they should, uh, I mean, obviously swap all your images out for a Wolfie based image and, you know, put everything declaratively in YAML. Like that's, I, I can get that that's the uh, subtitle for the show, but uh, what else? Give me something else. I think, uh, well, one thing to call out is the Chain Guard Academy on our site. Like we realize mm. this is a really complex space and it's complicated to understand if we're talking about physical supply chains or software supply chains. There's a lot of terminology, a lot of acronyms. So we, we launched um, the Chain Guard Academy right off our, our homepage to, to help explain some of these topics, work through the open source projects that we've mentioned today. Um, always, always interested in making improvements, of course, and getting feedback on here. But yeah, just a shout out for the academy because uh, I think, I think there's a lot of awareness. It's like, like you said in the beginning, like engineers just want to build their feature; they don't want to think about security um, until they have to. Uh, I think one <laughs> of our jobs at ChainGuard is to make sure the the CISOs don't have to testify in front of Congress. So this is on their <laughs> minds. They do have to. They, yeah. <laughs> they do have to worry about this. The, the government is is actually I've been I, I've been so surprised how quickly some of the re new regulation is coming down the pipeline and recommendations from the government. So there's going to be lots of companies that don't have a choice but to start thinking about these things. So yeah, just a shout out for Chain Guard Academy where we try to provide a bunch of resources for people to kind of learn a bit more about the space. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that it's still hard. I've used a couple of these tools in the sort of the supply chain SBOM industry over the years. And it's, I still struggle with how to explain to people every step that they need along the way from their Git commits all the yeah. way to production deployments. Right. And, and it's, it's a tough topic and it's not like we all just get one, like no one has really made the Docker run version of supply chain, supply chain security. And, uh, not that we've, not that we're all looking for that, but uh, I feel like everybody's setups are so different that it, you know, you mentioned on their website. I'm, let me, I'm, let me finish my thought here. <laughs> you mentioned on your website, there's actually a link for, or at the top on their products, there's this professional services stuff, and I actually thought that, like, well, that's the real value to me because, like, whatever I'm going to do with these tools, I likely don't know everything, and there's so many pitfalls i feel like so many potential areas where i will miss out on that part of my supply you know supply chain security cuz okay i put an image scanner in but i have no idea how to validate images in production or i have no idea how to be certain that the git repo commit is actually what's in the image and there's there's so many of these steps here where it's i don't know what the right steps are so that teams mm -hmm. can feel like so that people don't end up in front of congress um, so I, is that, is that, do you find this where like people are trying to implement this and they, they, a lot of them, because they're so different, it's hard to just get one universal tool that solves all these steps and you end up with the consulting path for a lot of your customers. Uh, yeah. So a lot of co companies have reached out and just like, where do we get started? How do we help yeah. out? And so we've done like risk assessments for them. It falls under the professional services thing, have, you know, kind of help look at their setups and their infrastructure and give some guidance on places to start. Uh, but a lot of the frameworks like uh, the SSDF is one that came out and Salsa is another one um, that's about uh, largely around like build, um, like supply chain integrity. So hardening down your build system. So a lot of good frameworks out there that people can take today and start kind of try to map and see how well they're doing or give them kind of a roadmap of sorts of what they should be tackling next in this space. But yeah, we, we offer some professional services to help kind of kickstart the journey for, for companies. Yeah. That, that whole, like, what do I do first? And then how do I get to the finish line? And where is that finish line for me is I always find a very nebulous path and, and I'm always need, I always need help. So I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad, yeah. that, I'm glad that these tools are existing, especially the Academy, because I think like we all want to think we're good at security. Like none of us want to, 
really think we're horrible at it, especially those of us that are talking about it on the internet constantly. And yet I, f- I still feel like I don't have a recommended consistent pattern and tool set for people, uh, for, especially for my customers. So um, we need more of this. We need more of this. I'm, and I'm, I'm looking forward to more in the Academy. Is the Academy uh, documentation? Are there videos there? Yeah, it's a mix of all of the above right now. We have the product documentation on there, tutorials. Uh, we try to pull in some of the open source stuff and, and weave that that's things in. And I think there's um, a couple of like uh, crash courses on like the six store stuff and things you can try out within the terminal right from the right from Oh, good. The Academy. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, I mean, we've been, the word six store has been thrown around for years in the Kubernetes community, but um, I think I'm I'm ready for us to get to the point where like that's just a like these are tools and processes that we all are generally understanding. Like we all eventually, you know, we started the Kubernetes uh, the container world where we didn't even understand how software needed to be deployed really with containers, right? Like, uh, how do you get it on my how do I get it on my servers and how do I repeatedly deploy it in a predictable way? And I feel like we're starting to get you know, wherever that bell curve is, we're starting to get to a place where people feel like they've got a pattern for implement, for deploying that's pretty consistent across CIs and and whatnot. And we have and we're all following that general idea of build, test, validate, approve, and ship or whatever. And I I don't feel like we're that as an industry, I feel like there's so much for more for us to grow in terms of all these uh security tools and how there should be a default set of tools and processes that every team that's deploying to Kubernetes or containers in general should have. And um, I'm pretty dumb on it myself, so I'm, I'm glad I'm having people like you on this show. Um, all right, so ChainGuard Academy, I'm definitely going to ha- recommend that to people and to check that out. Um, do you have a YouTube channel? I'm trying to remember. I actually didn't pull that up. Is there other resources that you can share? Dan is um, huge on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> finally a solid TikTok startup. I in, in in the Kubernetes space, we we needed you for so long. Yeah, I would start with a uh, start start by following our Twitter. We post all the good stuff from YouTube, okay. and TikTok, and everything there. So that is Twitter slash ChainGuard underscore Dev. All right. All right, anyone, uh, you lost your chance to ask more questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. This has been a great show. Thank you, Dan and Kim, for being on here with me. And hopefully next time we ha- we're, have, I'll have you on, we can do a walkthrough of making an image with Wolfie or something like that and actually doing some of this cool stuff. Once, uh... But congratulations on the launch, and I will see you both at KubeCon. Um, you, by the way, everyone, you can see their Twitter handles, handles below. You can follow them. You can follow ChainGuard underscore Dev on Twitter as well. And next week, who are we going to have next week? Um, I'm not at KubeCon next week. That is the week <laughs> after. <more> weeks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two more weeks. Um, next week is going to be my monthly Udemy course Q&A. So it's basically just me, uh, which means it's going to be more boring we don't have interesting people like Kim or Dan on. It's just going to be me talking, and it's all asking questions about containers in my courses. So if you're taking one of my courses or if you have general container questions that have no bearing on security, because we can cover all the security stuff today, um, that'll be next week. And then uh, the week after, we'll be at KubeCon. I will be high-fiving these fine people. These fine people. I'm reversed on my camera. I always get my directions mixed up. And uh, we'll, maybe we'll do a live show from there. So tell me what you're thinking about in the comments uh, for, the, for KubeCon, and I will see if we can make that happen. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you next year here, next week here on YouTube Live. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.